What would have happened if the Aztecs had been victorious over their European invaders and survived into the modern day as a fairly powerful nation? What would the world look like if the Japanese had beaten the Koreans fairly early on and developed a huge colonizing empire that spanned across the entire world? What about if Rome never collapsed? Or if the Sony Nintendo collaboration console actually went through and the PlayStation, the console that launched Sony into the video games industry, was never made. There are a boatload of alternate timelines and histories in this video, as this is the second part of this iceberg. Go back and check out the first one if you haven't already. Some of the ones in this video I have personally wondered about myself in the past, and some are so unusual and so new that they just completely blew my mind when I read about them. So without further ado, grab a drink. My choice today is black coffee with butter, and join me as we explore the alternate histories iceberg. Now the first entry in tier 7 is 1901. So this is an alt history written by Robert Conroy, who we actually covered a few of his alt histories in the first part of this iceberg. But 1901 explores a world where after winning the Spanish-American War, which happened in 1898, the US is just kind of chilling at this point. And after Germany, led by Kaiser Wilhelm II, tries to do business with America, they, for a multitude of reasons, refuse. And so Germany just declares war on them. Now bear in mind, this is the America of 1901. So before World War II, Germany really wasn't the massive military powerhouse that they are today. So Germany declares war on them. They invade from the East Coast. So New York, Connecticut, America starts freaking out and panicking. And the president, William McKinley just dies of a heart attack, which I guess being invaded by Germany is somewhat stressful, but he dies and the vice president, Teddy Roosevelt, becomes president. And as president, he's a little stronger than the last president, so he mounts an attack against the invading Germany, and they build up troops, build up weapons, launch an attack against them, and then they lose that battle. So not a great start. And the UK, who is on the US side, is doing stuff like attacking and trying to block a bunch of the German military and ships, as you know, they're kind of right next to them. And they are funding a bunch of resources and food and munitions in America. So it's a constant back and forth, you know, Germany wins one battle, then their ships are blocked by the UK, and then America wins another battle. It's just a constant tit for tat sort of thing, with no side really, really winning too heavily. Until America has somewhat of a decisive victory, at least in the short term. They destroy a bunch of ships, they destroy a bunch of land units, and the word of this defeat gets back to Germany, and the German people are just furious and disappointed in their king, or Kaiser, for getting them into this war and for doing so badly that they end up overthrowing Kaiser Wilhelm. And in his place, they put his son, who is also called Wilhelm, Wilhelm Helm the third in power, but he is young and naive and is put into that position mostly because he is young and naive and he can be manipulated and he's just kind of a figurehead for Germany at this point, with most of the decisions and power lying with the other political figures. Which, it's a bit strange if you're this kid. Like, these politicians just kill your dad, take him out of power, and then put you into power for some reason. So I can see what their strategy is, but it must have felt a little weird being this kid. So this history ends with this new government settling for peace essentially with America. They end the war and this whole thing basically makes Germany realize that it's probably not a good idea to go invading faraway lands. So they look around and wonder, hmm, where else can we invade that's like really close by? Poland maybe? France? And so this basically leads them to start an early World War I, World War II sort of deal. And it's hard to say in this timeline whether they would be a more formidable force or not, as they seem to be wiser and have more experience due to the war in America. They also weren't limited in their military like they were after World War I, but they did lose a bunch of ships and troops, etc. in the war with America. So maybe it balances out, maybe it doesn't, but it is an interesting one to think about nonetheless. The Guns of the South. Holy smokerino. So this is a book written by one of our favorite alt history writers, Harry Turtledove, who this is pretty much all he did. He just wrote alt histories. That was his favorite thing to do. But this one is a wild one. And it's more alt timeline, I guess, than alt history, as it involves a bunch of racists from South Africa going back in time and giving a bunch of the Southern Confederates of America AK-47s. So yeah, a very, very realistic timeline. They go back in time, they go up to Robert E. Lee, and they basically say, look, we've got these 
modern guns for you, we've got medicine, we've got technology. They give all of this to the South, and not surprisingly, this enables them to quite handily win the war. So after this happens, the North ends up surrendering. They have to pay a bunch of reparations to the South, and they cede a bunch of territory to them. And it seems everything is just going absolutely swimmingly for the South. But when the South African racists from the future, which is a phrase I'd never thought I'd say in my life, but when they first arrived into the South, they told the Confederates, look, we're from the future, and in the future, things are just awful. They said black people have basically taken over and they run every country in the world. They say white people are slaves and the black people treat them horribly. And basically, all of your suspicions about black people are completely true. They tell all of this to the Confederates, which makes the Confederates think that they were right all along. Obviously, they were doing this to, you know, ramp up the already racist South to become like, super racists or something. But eventually, after a while, Robert E. Lee finds a modern history book and he ends up reading it and he finds out that basically nothing about what these racists said was true. And that for the most part, the world has gotten more fair, more involved in civil rights and liberties. The world, especially the Western world, kind of condemns slavery pretty quite heavily. And so these people from South Africa were basically talking a bunch of nonsense. And Lee realizes that because in the future, slavery is basically mostly condemned, that maybe he was probably wrong and slavery isn't the right way to go. So this history book basically makes him do a complete 180 and he actually goes against these South African racists from the future. So he goes up to them, he confronts them about their lying and they don't take too kindly to that and there are massive shootouts that happen, there are assassinations that happen or at least are attempted and eventually I think just down to sheer numbers, the confederates end up surrounding and taking over this base that the future Future time travelers have made. They get in there, they destroy the time machine, and in the base they find even more futuristic technology, books, information, and not all of the time travelers were able to actually make it back to their original timeline. So Robert E. Lee says, you know, while you're here, we won't kill you just as long as you stay here and teach us some cool futuristic stuff. Maybe racism isn't the way. So because of his knowledge about the future and his change of heart, and with the Confederates having won the war and basically being in control of the United States, Lee passes a law to outlaw slavery and racism as much as a law can do that. And that is basically how it ends. Thanks to the new tech and information and weapons, the Confederate States of America are the most powerful nation in the world. They are more enlightened due to the whole no slavery and no racism thing. And they are incredibly wealthy, all thanks to these South African time-traveling racists. So I guess sometimes good things do come in strange packages. A world of difference is more sci-fi than alt history, I guess. In a world of difference, Mars, the planet, doesn't exist. Instead, in its place is a planet called Minerva. It is very similar to Earth, it's around the same size, it's bluish, greenish, and it was basically discovered around the same time as Mars by the same guy, so not much of the history has changed, just the physical properties of this planet. But the major bombshell in this story happens in the 1970s, when life is actually discovered on Minerva. A space probe is launched from Earth up to Minerva, and they capture a picture of a Minerva alien with a tool in its hand. And these aliens are incredibly freaky. Freaky looking not freaky like Anyway, this is the first evidence of intelligent life found anywhere on the universe other than Earth. So this is kind of a big deal. And did I mention they were kind of freaky looking? So we as humans look pretty normal. We got two arms, two legs, two eyes, two hearts, two stomachs, one for regular food and one for dessert. But these guys and gals have six of everything and it is spaced equally all around their bodies. So they're like this candle here with eyes sticking out in every single direction, arms and legs in all directions, and so you can never really sneak up on them, as their eyes are just looking everywhere all the time. Technology-wise, they are very, very basic, like at Stone Age level, but government-wise, they seem to be around the medieval period. So somewhat advanced in government, but technologically, they have no idea what they're doing. So as soon as this life is discovered up on Minerva, there is obviously a massive space race between a bunch of 
these superpowers on Earth to get up there, discover more stuff, set up space bases, and when they get there, they discover more and more stuff about the Minervans, one of them being the strange way in which they give birth. So, as I said, they have six of everything, and this includes six wombs. And every time a Minervan gets pregnant, they give birth to five females and one male in their, you know, six different wombs. And I don't even want to think about how they procreate. Like, if they've got six of everything, would it be like... Like, how does, that, how does that work? But when they give birth to these six children, it is a 100% guaranteed death sentence for the mother. So some of the humans up on Minerva are trying to solve this problem for them. You know, trying to figure out a way to allow Minervan mothers to give birth without dying all the time. And some of them are trying to take Minerva's resources, trying to study them for their own purposes, which I think is quite realistic when it comes to humans. We are both the best and worst species at the same time. But yeah, as I said, more sci-fi probably than alt history. But if you do like sci-fi, it is a fantastic read. The Neanderthal Parallax. So this explores a, again, somewhat sci-fi-ish world where scientists in Ontario are performing an experiment and then out of nowhere, Neanderthals, or Neanderthal. So a mysterious man appears to them, and they don't know where he's come from, he starts talking to them, and after a while, they come to the conclusion that this mysterious man is a Neanderthal, which is pretty strange, and they wonder how that's even possible, but they figure out that this Neanderthal is from an alternate reality, or an alternate dimension, alternate timeline, where Neanderthals developed as the dominant human species, instead of Homo sapiens, or us. They learn that this Neanderthal is a quantum physicist in his reality, which is pretty convenient, and he arrived into our reality after an experiment in his reality went wrong. And the two realities, the, I'll just call them humans for now, us, the human reality and the Neanderthal reality, they end up actually forming a bridge or gateway between themselves. So we're able to go over into their reality and see what it's like to live as a Neanderthal in the Neanderthal society. Now this story and timeline has a ton of detail in, so I won't go into all of the detail on it, but I'll just do a little quick speed run of it, covering what I see as the most important parts of the story. So in their culture, the Neanderthals are still hunter-gatherers, and they haven't developed agriculture, they haven't developed farms, and this means they've overall explored less of the earth than we have, but they do have a more healthy connection with the earth and with nature and with animals and with plants as they haven't, you know, been mass destroying forests, setting up farms, setting up cattle places. It's just all very, you know, hippie-ish, grab some mushrooms, grab a berry, kill a rabbit, which is pretty sad, but necessary. But because they lack agriculture, they've also got a much smaller population worldwide, racking in at around 200 million compared to our, you know, 8 billion. And they are basically as technologically advanced as we are in terms of quantum physics, quantum science, technologies, helicopters, airplanes, but a major divergence is how they set up generations and society and breeding. So it's a little strange and hard to explain, but they basically set it up so that you can only give birth every 10 years, and it's the same 10 years for everyone. Every 10 years, a bunch of people in society gather, they agree they're gonna meet up, do the stuff and all be pregnant at like roughly the same time and so when that whole generation gives birth they'll all be born in the same year and so will all be at the same age then 10 years later this all happens again and no one is really born in between generations so say you are 20 years old everyone you know will be multiples of 10 so all the kids in your neighborhood will be exactly 10 years old maybe your parents are both exactly 40 years old their parents are exactly 60 and then when you turn 21 everyone else will either turn 11 or 31 or 41 and that's basically how it goes it's a very strange system and you might be thinking they are a very clean culture, they're very in touch with nature, very in touch with their environment, they seem to be doing pretty well, so it's like our society, only better. Except, they have a one world government and commit eugenics on the population, so that's not good. To try and perfect the DNA of the Neanderthal, anyone who commits a violent act is not imprisoned or killed, but rather they are castrated, which is 
pretty horrible on its own. But that's not all. Anyone who has 50% or more of the DNA that you have, or who shares DNA with you, more than 50%, so that would be your parents and your children, they are also all castrated. Which, this just goes from, like, a harsh punishment to a downright unfathomably evil one. And their idea behind this is you clearly have some violent DNA, and so anyone who shares most of your DNA, including yourself, just gets taken out of the gene pool, so hopefully in a few generations we won't have this violence problem anymore. So yeah, I don't know if this whole Neanderthal civilization still seems like a good deal. The Neanderthals have also previously done this on their species, where they did it to raise the average intelligence level of the Neanderthals. So at some point in the past, they took the least intelligent 10% of the population and castrated them, removing their genes from the gene pool, and this apparently had a positive effect on the intelligence of the generations going forward, which yeah, you make the Neanderthals more intelligent, but like, at what cost? As well as having a one-world government, they also have chips in everyone's arms, monitoring what they do all the time, where they go, which is fun. And also, there is a lot more domestic violence than is probably reported, as because of the system, a lot of wives don't want to report the domestic abuse that they're suffering, as this would end up with their own kids being castrated. So yeah, a very, very messed up system. They've domesticated wolves, like full-size wolves, which, I mean, yeah, that is, that is pretty cool. And their monetary system seems to be some form of communism that actually works, in that people are kind of given what they're needed, and in this reality, everyone isn't, you know, starving to death. Their medicine is actually pretty advanced, and it's a pretty cool part of this story, where if you're getting a surgery on your arm, they don't do what we would do, you know, either put the person to sleep, or to numb that local area to work on it, but instead they use advanced robotics to just block the neural receptors in our brain, so so that we can't feel pain in this area. So it's all super advanced, it's super reversible, it's super casual, and they don't need to numb the area or anything like that. Just block the neural connections, perform the surgery, reconnect the neural connections back up, and Bob's your teapot. And as a society, as a species, they don't have religion, as it says their brains are not physically capable of believing in a god or having a religious experience because of the structure of their brains, which I'm not really sure that's how it works, but okay. And that's basically the entire society. They do try to team up and come together in the end, as there is a massive disaster looming on our reality. So they're, you know, helping us out with that one. So as I said, a very sci-fi-ish one, not too much alt history in this one, but it does open up more questions about what Neanderthals might be like if, as in this reality, they were the dominant species instead of us. And they very nearly might have been. The 2020 Commission Report. This is a fun one. And its full name is the 2020 Commission Report on the North Korean nuclear attacks against the United States. Which, I mean, that basically just tells you the entire story. So in this timeline, North Korea nukes America in 2020. And this book is written in the style of a government report written in 2023 about the events in 2020. Basically, North Korea mistakes a civilian plane for a stealth United States one. And so they end up shooting down the civilian plane. And because they shoot down the plane, this leads South Korea to retaliate against them because, you know, it's a civilian plane. And South Korea ends up firing missiles at North Korea. North Korea reads some completely unrelated tweets from Donald Trump, which they misinterpret as being tweets directed at North Korea. And so they read these as, oh, Trump is threatening us, Trump is going to launch a nuclear attack. And so North Korea launches a bunch of preemptive attacks on America in Florida, Virginia, Hawaii, as well as a few other places. And it ends with the US and South Korea invading North Korea and Kim Jong-un being surrounded and taking care of himself, shall we say. And it ends with Mike Pence becoming president, which I don't think anyone in America would have wanted. Left or right, old or young, the dude kind of sucks. So this is one that's not completely impossible to have happened. Thankfully, it didn't happen in 2020 and since, but with North Korea, I guess you never can tell. 
does it now? Wow. Georgie is a really cool series of French comics that kind of remind me of something like the What If series from Marvel, where instead of just one alt history, each individual comic goes through a different What If, basically. And there are a lot of issues. It's up to 47 at the moment, I believe. And it's still an ongoing series with additions coming out all the time. So for sure, go and check it out. You need to speak French, obviously, to read or understand it. But if you speak French, you're in luck. And if you don't speak French, this is a sign to start. And that leads us to the sponsor of this video. I'm just kidding. That would be a pretty cool segue though. But if you do happen to speak French or learn French, you have a pretty cool little series on your hands. Some of these stories include, and I'm going to absolutely butcher some of these French names. So if you speak French, just mute me for a few minutes. But we have Les Russes sur la Lune, or Russians on the Moon, which is a alt timeline of what if Russia won the space race. We have Apocalypse sur le Texas, or Apocalypse over Texas, where the Cuban Missile Crisis actually causes a nuclear war between America and Russia, which results in further fighting around Texas and eventually, you know, an apocalypse. Colom Pasha, or Columbus Pasha, which is where a man named Abdul Columbus actually discovers America instead of the Europeans and claims them in the name of the East and of Islam. There are loads, loads, loads more of these stories, which I'll just scroll through them a little bit here so you can see them. But they're all fairly short, they're fairly digestible and fun, and there is a ton of variety in the types of stories that they tell. The only downside, which I mentioned earlier, obviously, is you have to speak French, as I couldn't find any reliable translations of these into English, but a fantastic series nonetheless. The less. JFK in 64, a novel. So this one I think is pretty self-explanatory. What if JFK wasn't killed in 1963 and instead went on to run for the election in 1964? The assassination attempt is still like planned and set up, but Kennedy ends up for whatever reason not going through that area and so the actual assassination never takes place. He spends the next year working on his presidency, doing presidential things as, you know, he still is the president, and working on his re-election in 1964. And this all is basically what the story covers. What he would have done in that next year, what policies he would have covered or pushed through, and what changes we might end up having if JFK remained president instead of Lyndon B. Johnson. And in fact, in this timeline, instead of becoming president, Lyndon B. Johnson actually ends up getting in massive trouble and almost doing some major jail time, which is not a great thing, but is vastly different to him actually actually ruling the country. So a fantastic read and a incredibly well-written and well-detailed alternate timeline. Fear, Loathing and Gumbo on the Campaign Trail 72. So this is another alt history from the alternate history forums, which from the ones I've already covered and read, they are often very, very well written, incredibly detailed and well thought out as they're almost a collaboration kind of back and forth between multiple experts in history. So if you want often very well written very realistic scenarios, do definitely check the website out. But this covers the timeline of what if in 1972, what if as well as President Nixon running for re-election, what if McGovern, Wallace, and the governor of Louisiana at the time, John McKeithen, also ran for the presidency. This leads to a crazy democratic primary where it's really unclear who is actually going to be elected president. In our timeline, what actually happened? McGovern was actually elected for the representative of the Democrats and ended up losing pretty badly to Nixon, so Nixon was re-elected. But in this timeline, McKeithen actually pulls through for the primary election, and so it is McKeithen versus Nixon in the general election, as well as a few other candidates. And this four-way race between the candidates is actually in incredibly close and none of them end up getting the 270 points required to win the presidency. So it goes into this like state of limbo pretty much. First there's no president whatsoever and then the vice president becomes president and still the people aren't voting any differently. The politicians can't really decide on a winner and Nixon while he's still president basically goes 
flippant insane, like war criminal levels of insane. Gorbachev of Russia ends up getting his plane shot down by the Chinese. China itself ends up becoming basically like a North Korea, hyper aggressive, secretive, militant, and controlling of its people, and not diplomatic in any way and super threatening to the entire world, which that's not good. As I said, the vice president Spiro Agnew, Spiro? Spiro Agnew ends up becoming president, and he is basically, you know, the sitting president while this is all getting sorted out, but it's going on and on and on, and it seems like he might just become full president for the whole term, and nobody likes this, not even Nixon. There is a ton of drama, more so than is necessary in Vietnam, in China, and Agnew is doing just an awful job as president, and so so as much as it pains him, this leads to Nixon actually seeding the race, resulting in McKeithen actually being declared President of the United States. Agnew is stripped of his presidential powers, everyone lets out a sigh of relief, and then McKeithen dies in a plane crash, which is not suspicious whatsoever. Then there are further political fights and debates about who should be president now. Nixon ceded the race. McKeithen died in a plane crash. Agnew is only sitting president. So Wallace claims that he should be made president despite getting a absolutely tiny amount of the votes. It is, I'll admit, an insanely well-written and well-detailed account of what likely reasonably could have happened and the entire timeline is damn near book length like we're talking hundreds of pages of discussion here so if you do like this sort of thing if you like political timelines definitely go check it out as it is some great stuff. Redworld is a mod for Hearts of Iron 4, which as a lot of people pointed out on the last video on this iceberg, Hearts of Iron is a super, super cool game series that lets you explore history and historical times and scenarios through multiple different perspectives and countries. And Redworld is just one of the many, many mods for Hearts of Iron. And every single mod is super unique, super creative, and lets you actually physically explore different timelines, different histories, and is just, yeah, insanely fun if you're into that sort of thing. But this particular one, Redwald, lets you explore a timeline in which the USSR wins the Cold War, which yeah, I know that's not too original. We have covered a few scenarios like this, but this isn't just a scenario. This is a game and you can actually play through it and help decide some future events that actually happen. Super cool. So as I said, the USSR wins the Cold War. The US is basically broken up into these like smaller countries, essentially. And these smaller countries are basically all individual states, entities, and there's no overarching federal government like there is in our timeline. You have a bunch of these regions, so I'll just go through a few of them here. You have the American Republic, which is thought by many people, themselves included, to be kind of the remains of the United States in a way, or at least what it used to be. You know, same ideals, same styles, same government. And they also have the largest navy in America, which is always a nice thing to have. Then we have the Midwest Union, who they also kind of claim to be the original America, but nobody really except themselves agrees on this. They are a bunch of former US states in the Midwest, obviously, that aren't really that rich or that strong, but they do exist. There is the American People's Commonwealth, which is a socialist nation led by Noam Chomsky, which is interesting. There's the Federation of Illinois, which basically consists of Illinois and Missouri. Texas, which finally got its own independence. It is run by a man named Rick Perry and the very nationalistic One Republic Party. And it is quite strong, but it has been slowly losing territory to Mexico and to the American Republic. So the One Republic Party is, you know, intent on making Texas stronger and in holding their ground, not ceding any more territory and perhaps, if they're strong enough, taking some of it back. Alaska as a state is independent now, as is Montana, Arizona, which has a really cool flag. Like, I don't know why I like this flag so much, but it just looks really cool. Mwah. But they are a fairly rich nation with decent resources, a decent force. There is Hawaii, which is run by Tulsi Gabbard, which is interesting. There is Utah, which is comprised mostly of Utah, obviously, but also of Nevada, Idaho, Wyoming, and Colorado. Then, and I know there's a bunch of these, but just bear with me. Then there is the Union of American People's Republic, or the UAPR, which is a communist nation that is super, super supportive of the US 
USSR, and it's basically supported by them militarily, financially, and is kind of like a arm for the USSR in America. There is the Great Lakes Republic comprised of Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, and Iowa, and the Union of Lincoln led ironically by a white supremacist, Richard Spencer. And the Union of Lincoln is a fairly new nation, only having recently broken away from Montana, which is another deeply racist state, or country I guess technically. So that's basically all of the nations in the new United States. And I guess it's not the United States anymore, but the new area of North America. And as you can tell, it is completely broken up. There are a bunch of obviously standalone states, there are a bunch of unions, and the main big player in this whole timeline is obviously the USSR. They are basically the world's super superpower due to a change of events during the Cuban Missile Crisis, but the question is how long can they hold on to that power? This for me was a fantastic fascinating deep dive and read, and it must just be amazing actually playing this game or at least this mod. I am seriously considering picking it up for myself, as to play through a few of these would, I think, be super, super interesting. And especially because this is not just a story, it's like an interactive game where you can affect the actual outcome of it and play from multiple different sides. It's probably like 10 or 20 different stories in the same universe. So super, super cool timeline, especially and maybe even mostly because of all of these different very, very cool flags. And I have no idea how to pronounce this one, so apologies Magda, but I'm gonna go with Kazavras Vizrin, which is a fantastically written Polish military alt history, where the Russians quite heavily won the Polish-Russian war in the 1920s. In reality, the war was kind of a draw. You know, both sides fought each other, took some losses, took some gains, and then agreed to end the war, mark their territories, and no side really massively won. But in this timeline, Russia wins the war, Poland gets absorbed into the Soviet Union, and Russia basically tries to wipe out Polish sentiment, Polish history, Polish culture, and the Polish language in order to stop the Poles having, you know, a sense of history, a sense of heritage, and to stop stop them eventually uprising. So Stalin sends thousands of Polish people out to Siberia, which is a fun place to be sent, and speaking Polish or showing patriotism for Poland or anything to do with Polish culture is punishable by death. The Soviets continue to grow in power over the years, and they eventually make more of a land grab onto Europe, and in 1944, this results in a massive nuclear war. What basically happens is the USSR keeps pushing further and further into Europe, and the Allies drop three nukes in Leningrad, Warsaw, and Kiev, essentially pushing the Soviets back and basically ending the war. And this area between the three nukes becomes known as the Atomic Triangle and it is just completely wiped out, filled with radiation and stuff like mutated plants and mutated people for years to come. After the nukes were dropped, the war kind of ended. Millions ended up dying from it, but nothing really much major changed until the 1980s. And this is when the titular character Kazavras Vizrin, again, I'm terribly sorry, Kazavras Vizrin. Anyway, that dude rallies a fighting force in Poland against the Soviets, and he starts somewhat of a massive rebellion. He is tactical, he is strategic, he is charismatic, and he's Polish, a true revolutionary, and almost a legendary character in Poland at the time. And all throughout Europe, all throughout the, especially eastern part of Europe, the tales of his rebellion starts to spread, and this inspires more and more countries to fight back against the Soviets. Hungary, the Balkans, Czechoslovakia, and Ukraine, just to name a few, are some of the countries that form open rebellions against the Soviet Union, and this whole region of Eastern Europe basically just becomes a giant war zone, and in this war zone is part of the Atomic Triangle. This takes place in 1996, this entire 
middle area is just like I said, this no man's land, anything goes war zone sort of place with no clear direction or order. There's just like rockets and bombs flying everywhere. Everyone's kind of fighting an unknown enemy. Or they know they're fighting the Soviet Union, but it's kind of hard to tell with all the crazy chaos going on. The Soviets are just shooting people left and right, trying to quell all of the rebellions and to take back the land that they are slowly losing. And due to all this chaos that the Soviet Union and Russia is now going through, the Chinese see this as a perfect opportunity to attack them. And so it is just absolute madness. All round, it's a pretty interesting alt history, I'd say. As I said, it's kind of centered around this almost legendary figure, and it is based off a single point in history changing slightly, which is personally my preference for alt histories, being the Russian-Polish war going just slightly differently. A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court. So this one is an absolute classic. And I say classic because it was written like 130 years ago in 1889. So yeah, a very old story. It was written by Mark Twain and describes the story of this engineer from Connecticut who gets knocked out for a few reasons and ends up waking up underneath an oak tree with no idea where he is or how he got there. And soon enough, a knight, Sir Kay, finds him challenges him to a fight, ends up winning and captures the engineer called Hank and takes him back to Camelot Castle. So yeah, as you can probably already tell, this is going to be a wild one. So Hank somehow traveled from the 1800s to the 500s or 528 to be exact and traveled from Connecticut where he was to King Arthur's land, basically England. So when the knight takes him to Camelot Castle, King Arthur is not too impressed with him. Merlin the famous wizard isn't too impressed with Hank either. He's a little jealous of him. He thinks, I think, secretly that he's more intelligent than he is, that he's more mysterious than he is, perhaps. And so Merlin is actually a driving force in getting Hank sentenced to death. But Hank remembers, I guess, from his time in school or something, that on this year, 528, there was actually a solar eclipse in England. And he says to them, as he's being prepared to be sentenced to death, that if you don't let me go, I will block out the sun for all eternity. And of course, they don't really take him seriously until the sun starts to be blocked out. And then they are just wholly convinced that he's a powerful sorcerer, and they agree to let him go and actually make him one of the most powerful people in the realm. Class Classic ancient mentality. He then goes on to perform more and more tricks using his skills as an engineer and, you know, the knowledge he's acquired over the years in the future to make these more simple people believe he is a incredibly powerful sorcerer. And partly to get back at Merlin for, you know, basically sentencing him to death, he makes a lightning rod and puts it at the top of Merlin's castle and then makes a cable that goes all the way down to the bottom with some explosives that he's set. And he does this all in secret, he doesn't really tell anyone. And and then when the weather starts to get rainy, stormy, lightning-y, he makes a threat to Merlin and says that he will call down magic from the heavens to destroy Merlin's tower and that if Merlin is really a powerful sorcerer, he should be able to use his magic to stop it. And of course, when lightning strikes, it hits the tower, it follows down the wires to the bottom, and the entire tower just explodes. This, of course, is a bit of revenge on Merlin, as well as kind of pointing out to everyone that Merlin is somewhat of a fraud, or at least a less powerful sorcerer than Hank is. And then, because he is basically second in command in the nation, next to King Arthur, he starts enacting these mass changes of the entire nation. He sets up these secret schools that teach, like, modern mathematics, modern engineering, stuff like reading and writing, which I think is taken for granted in our world. And he sets up factories to produce modern weapons, guns, mines, and stuff like transportation, bicycles, etc. He then goes on an epic adventure to rescue some princesses, and the princesses turn out to be pigs, don't ask me why, and throughout the story he's just constantly debunking people and proving people wrong, and also further cementing in people's minds that he is a powerful sorcerer with his knowledge and with his tech. He also goes on a little adventure with King Arthur himself, and they go through some massive hardships, they pose as peasants, they get captured into slavery, and when they are eventually rescued, this reveals to King Arthur that 
slavery is kind of a horrible thing, being poor is kind of a horrible thing, and so this flicks a little switch in King Arthur's mind, and kind of pushes him to make everything a little more fair in the nation, and to outlaw slavery, which is a fantastic realization, I'd say especially for that time in history. And this is basically where things start to take a turn for the worst for Hank. So one of the knights, Sir Sagramore, gets a little jealous, I guess, and he challenges Hank to a fight. Hank accepts the fight and ends up actually beating Sir Sagramore using a lasso, which I guess they didn't have back then. And he then goes on to fight and defeat seven more knights using this same weapon and method. So later on, Merlin steals Hank's lasso, and with his lasso gone, Sir Sagramore challenges him again to a fight. And so obviously with his lasso gone, he's gonna lose this fight until he pulls out a freaking revolver and just shoots Sir Sagramore dead. He then fights a bunch of the other knights all at once straight afterwards and ends up shooting and killing nine more knights. And after this, nobody really wants to fight him anymore, which I mean, Surprise, surprise. So Hank solidifies some of his power, and a few years later, under this ploy from the church, who basically wants to get rid of Hank because they think he's too powerful, they send 30,000 knights after Hank to try and kill him, which is a lot of knights for one man, but he is Hank. So he takes himself and 52 other students that he has. Like a lot of them are teenagers, they're not really soldiers, they're more, you know, learned people that are skilled with the weapons and tools that he's been building. And so he bunkers down with all of these people into Merlin's cave, and he basically sets up base down here. He booby traps the hole outside with electric wire and with landmines, and they set up these Gatling guns pointing at the entrances. So when the knights come with their armor and horses, and swords and stuff, they are just completely wiped out by the mines and the freaking Gatling guns. Like, it's not even close, they stand basically no chance, and almost all of the 30,000 knights are just killed. But Hank and his students are now trapped in Merlin's cave, with 30,000 slowly rotting knight corpses outside. And obviously 30,000 bodies all collapsed in and around the caves. Like, there's no way you are getting out of that anytime soon. And slowly, these bodies start to decay, start to rot, disease spreads around the whole area, and all of the people in the cave slowly start to get ill and die. Hank does, after the battle, go out and try to help some of these knights, you know, from their wounds, but the first one he approaches, the first one, takes his knife and just stabs Hank, which is just fantastic. Then he is bedridden, he gets eventually cursed by Merlin to sleep for 1300 years, and he apparently does sleep for this long, he wakes up in the 1800s, back where he's from, and he tells his tale to the narrator, which is how we come to know what actually went on in this story. And then, soon after this, Hank just dies. So as I said, not a super realistic alternate history, but it is probably honestly one of my favorite stories of all time, as it's got time travel, it's got cool contraptions, and it's got magic and knights and all of that cool classical stuff. A very cool old book universe story to explore, and I think one of Mark Twain's most fun ones. Lands of Red and Gold is quite a unique alternate history. It explores the idea of what if Australia had become a largely agricultural land before the European settlers arrived. And to explore why this matters and why in our timeline the Aboriginal Australians never set up an agricultural society, we need to quickly touch on something called founder crops. So obviously to go for a hunter-gatherer society to a settled agricultural farm-based society, you need crops and plants to be domesticated and grown in fields and farms. So that's all pretty straightforward, and there were actually crops and plants that could be domesticated in Australia at the time. The macadamia nut, for example, is one of these, and or the Australian spinach. There are really a bunch of these, but they were never domesticated by the Australian aboriginals. And this is because these crops and plants and, you know, nuts, etc., were able to be domesticated, but they weren't founder crops. And founder crops seem to be quite rare crops that are basically like the cheat code from going from a hunter-gatherer society to a farming society. Like, if you'll imagine macadamia nuts, they couldn't, as a society, afford to spend time and energy learning how to set up a farm just to grow macadamia nuts because they wouldn't provide enough sustenance or energy for the entire group. 
So a founder crop is something we've observed in many societies, where it's firstly domesticatable, it's fairly easy to grow, and it provides a lot of yield and a lot of energy. So it's like a farming crop on kind of easy mode, and that allows societies that have no farming experience to take this one single founder crop and make some attempt at domesticating it, at farming it, and even when they are not that good at it, still yield enough to feed a decent chunk of the society or the group and still teach them a fair amount of farming. Whereas again, back to the macadamia example, they are harder to grow, especially for a group with no farming experience. And even if they succeeded in growing these and they had a whole macadamia farm, it wouldn't really have benefited them so much. Like you couldn't run a entire population on just macadamia nuts. So this lack of founder crops on Australia was actually a large part of what stopped them becoming a agricultural society. And it kind of bottlenecked them as a people. So that's a little farming lesson for you. But Lands of Red and Gold explores a world where Australia actually does have a founder crop, that being the Red Yam. This leads to it being quite quickly domesticated, to the native Australians setting up an agricultural culture, and to basically the entire island and its people advancing in technology and society faster than they did in our timeline. And so the aboriginals weren't as easily pushed around by the invading Europeans, and they were able to, you know, Put up more of a fight. When the Europeans arrive in the 1800s, they are somewhat impressed by the society as a whole, and they've set up areas, towns, farms, and have even started working with stuff like metal in certain areas. There is mention of this religion that is prevalent in Australia, which it's quite interesting and it has a bunch of pretty fun gods within it. There is Lightning Man, Water Mother, the Fire Brothers, the Rainbow Serpent, Bark Man, the Green Lady, Eagle, just eagle and she who must not be named which i mean that's just a straight rip off of harry potter but what do i know and because these populations are all closer together due to being farmers there are certain diseases that have developed in the population and the australian people have you know over the years grown used to them so when the europeans come over and start you know spreading diseases of their own stuff like smallpox measles tb etc the europeans also catch a ton of diseases from the australians which didn't really happen in our timeline. And it's a pretty cool alternate timeline just based on the change of one small crop in Australia, the Red Yam. Full Metal Panic, or just Full Metal in Japanese, or Furu Meturu Panuku in Romanized Japanese. And I swear to God, that's what it is. And I do apologize because I will butcher some of these Japanese pronunciations, but it is a light novel and anime series that follows this one guy, Susuke Sagara, who works for this undercover secret military group. So he goes on this mission essentially, moves to Japan, starts attending this same high school as this girl, and is basically known as this super weird kid in school, but super strategic and combat minded. Kaname thinks he's a little weird, but after he does protect Kaname a few times, she realizes that he is there protecting her and she doesn't know why she's being attacked. He doesn't really know why she's being targeted either and why all these random organizations are, you know, trying to attack Kaname. He just knows that he has to protect her. So that's the whole plot. Basically, it's a super cute, super funny sort of thing that you'd expect out of a anime or a light Japanese novel. But as far as it being a alternate timeline or alternate history, there are a few major differences happening between their timeline and our timeline. One of them being the Cold War is still happening. For example, this is in the year 2000 and it's still going on. China is divided between North and South China, kind of like Korea is. Gorbachev ended up being assassinated. There was a nuke used in the Middle East, which caused more and more fighting, if you can believe it, in the Middle East. And because probably Probably partly this is an anime, and partly because all of the changes to our timeline that I mentioned. This resulted in new tech being created, stuff like armored, weaponized robots, robot suits, and a few really cool devices, one of which can convert mental energy or thought into physical force. So yeah, a pretty cool story and timeline that you should definitely check out if you do like the 
classical anime stuff. Resistance Fall of Man. So this is an anime with some interesting what-ifs around this alien species, the Chimera, coming down to Earth and capturing and transforming humans into these mutant creature soldiers that eventually end up fighting for the Chimera. The invasion happens in the 1900s, and by the 1950s they are invading Britain and the British Isles, and then they work their way towards America. The humans are all the while fighting back against the Chimera, and they form this, you know, resistance. So a cool universe, a cool idea and story, but not really a super historical or accurate alternate timeline. Atomic Heart is another video game universe that takes place in an alternate Soviet Union in the 1950s. Basically, what if the Soviet Union, but with a giant robot uprising, and with that, you have Atomic Heart. The split from our timeline happens in the 1930s, where the Soviets basically develop these super advanced robots, and then because of this breakthrough, it allows them to use the robots for a lot of the manual labor, basically fixing a lot of the problems that the Soviet Union had around that time. And because the people of the Soviet Union were now freed from all of this manual labor, that allowed them more time to think and more time to come up with further advancements in technology, and this led to a rapid, rapid development of more and more advanced stuff. Then, during World War II, just before Germany is about to lose the war, they release a freaking plague on everyone, which, I mean, classic Germans, and this plague results in even more of a need and want for these advanced Soviet techs. So, the Soviets are quite ahead of everyone else technologically. They basically invent Neuralink. Then there is an accident, an incident in one of the factories, until the leaders realize that this wasn't really an accident accident, and that a bunch of the robots have actually gone rogue and are planning to take over humanity. And that is basically Atomic Heart. It seems like a really cool game, it's a shooty game, it's a stealthy game. You can kill different robots that you meet and actually take their parts and use them to make weapons for yourself, which is a really cool concept that I like. So if you're into the Soviet Union era of stuff, if you're into alt timelines, or if you're just into a really cool game, I'd say definitely check it out. The Leviathan Trilogy, Leviathan, Goliath, and Behemoth. So this one is a really, really cool concept where during World War I, for whatever reason, the central powers, so Germany, Bulgaria, the Ottoman Empire, and Austria-Hungary are technologically superior to the Allies. You know, they have robots, they have steampunk machines, they have machine guns, but the Allies are biologically superior in their tech. So they have a giant bear the size of a house, they have a two-headed eagle, they have a giant flying or floating sort of creature that's basically used as like an airship, which this is the Leviathan, and they have giant sea creatures that they use for navy warfare, such as the Behemoth and the Krakens. So yeah, an insanely cool universe and concept, I think, and a very interesting setting being in World War One. Right, so I'm not too sure I can say this word on YouTube as silly as it seems without being demonetized, so we'll just go ahead and call it Swatika Knight. Silly, I know, but what are you going to do? So this was a story written actually in 1937, which is technically before World War II actually broke out, but it imagines a world in which World War II does actually break out, and the Axis powers win, enacting Hitler's Thousand Year Reich. So this story is set hundreds of years into this Reich, and it's honestly not a pretty sight. It's very reminiscent of 1984, the book, and was actually written around 10 years before 1984 was written, so 1984 might have actually taken some inspiration from this story. It paints a world of this insane dictatorship of constant brainwashing and rewriting of history. There is just constant propaganda. The Jews have been wiped out. The Christians are oppressed. Women are basically completely imprisoned and used almost exclusively for breeding. And Hitler is just completely revered and treated as almost a god and was said to be a seven foot long blonde haired man who was basically perfect in every single way. The main religion is the Hitlerian religion, and there are a bunch of holy sites all throughout Germany where people can go on pilgrimages to practice their Hitlerian faith. So yeah, an insane story, an insane timeline, probably a fairly quite realistic look on what a few hundred years of Hitlerian rule would look like, which I guess that's a word now. And it's interesting to think that this story was written before World War II even broke out. So while writing this story, the author didn't even know about 
about World War II or if or even when it would happen. And he predicted it actually happening of Hitler winning and what that would actually look like. So I can only imagine how this alt timeline and story would have been seen like if the Axis powers had actually won World War II. But thankfully they didn't. And thankfully this story is just a story. Kind of a nightmare, but still a story. Tempest Rising is a strategy game that basically explores the question of what if the Cuban Missile Crisis actually escalated into a full-blown war. Well, in this game and timeline, the war led to large parts of the world being nuked and irradiated, and explores 34 years later the struggle between these two major forces in the world, the GDF or Global Defense Forces, and the Tempest Dynasty. They are fighting for control of not just Earth, but also of this strange energy source, the Tempest, which is this odd plant-like vine that is just cropping up everywhere in the irradiated zones. So yeah, for some reason, this very strange plant is growing in specifically these zones that were nuked. And that's basically the whole story. So I don't know how realistic this super plant is growing in irradiated zones, but I think the more realistic part of it is that the Cuban Missile Crisis could have gone very, very badly for basically the entire world. So we should all say a prayer for Stanislav. Tier 9, if Israel lost the war. So this explores the scenario of what if Israel had lost the Six Years' War in the 1960s. So in this alt history, the Arabs get a surprise attack on Israel, and following this, they win the land battles and eventually end up invading Israel. Basically the opposite of what actually happened in our timeline. This leads to most of the Jews either being killed or displaced, and to the Palestinian Arabs not being given Palestine. But rather, Palestine is divided up between Egypt, Jordan, Syria and Lebanon. So the Palestinian Arabs basically feel like they were being used by the Arabs to help them win this war and they're not even given their old homes in Palestine or any of Palestine whatsoever. So they basically grow resentful of the Arabs, they team up with the Jews, and work to fight back and take back Palestine, and Israel of course. And on the American side, RFK doesn't end up being assassinated, because Siran Siran, the guy who killed him, actually leaves America at the time to go back to Palestine during the war, or at least after the war. So RFK ends up winning the presidency and becomes the 38th president of the United States. So a whole bunch of very important changes, all from the decisiveness of just this one battle. Bring the Jubilee was a book written in 1953 that explores a world in which during the American Civil War, the South wins first the Battle of Gettysburg and then the entire war. So the North, after losing for a while, ends up surrendering to the South. The South then just over time gets stronger and stronger, ends up invading Mexico and big parts of South America. After they invade Mexico, they rename Mexico City to Leesburg after Robert E. Lee, and the South is just an incredibly powerful nation, being basically one of only two superpowers in the entire world. The other is the German Union, which is basically the entirety of Germany combined with the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The United States, so like the North or the Union, is kind of like Canada in our timeline. They are just up there, they're a fair bit weaker than their southern counterpart. And due to the cost of the war and reparations and having to give up some of their land to the south, they are actually a fairly poor country. Because of the northern defeat, there are a bunch of things that weren't invented in this timeline, like incandescent light bulbs, modern aircrafts, and actually the telephone. So they still use telegraphs as their main way of communicating. The north basically has no military, no real way of defending all of their land, and they kind of slowly get colonized by other nations. Like, it's not a full colonization, but you have tons of other countries setting up bases and stuff in the American land, and you have kind of a massive flip in that the North is now super racist towards black people because they basically blame black people for their loss in the Civil War, saying that, you know, we lost the war and the whole reason we were fighting the war was basically for you, and now we are an incredibly poor nation. So yeah, very poor, 
almost no military, kind of a degenerate society, and super racist. So, fun times. Then the narrator, who is a historian in this alt timeline, decides to go back in time, like, just decides it, I guess. And this was going so well and realistic up to this point. And even the tagline on the cover of this story says a realistic novel, but then they just throw in this random decision-based time travel. But in this alternate timeline, a descendant of a general in the Civil War ends up inventing time travel. So the narrator in the modern time uses this time travel to go back to the war, you know, because he's a historian, he wants to witness the war firsthand, and he accidentally causes, like, the grandfather paradox, where he causes the death of this specific general, meaning that he never gets to have kids, and his kids never get to have kids, and then many generations later, they never end up inventing time travel, and so the time machine, I guess, is just disappeared, and the historian can never get back to the future. And also, because this general died in the war, that ends up causing the North to actually win, and it's kind of implied that this eventually causes our timeline. You know, one in which the North wins, and everything plays out as it has. So he's basically culled the only timeline in which time travel has been invented, and so we're never able to invent time travel, and and go back and change this in some way. And because he's stuck in the past, he ends up writing this journal, these accounts of himself and what he's thinking and what happened. And the year that this book was released was the same year that this journal in universe was found. So it's also kind of implied that the author of this book didn't actually write the book, but he, you know, found this journal of this time-traveling event and published it as a book. I mean, obviously that's not what happened, but it is kind of a cool perspective and writing idea to explore. So while we have covered a Southern Victory style alternate timeline before, I don't think any of them had quite this outcome. And so even if someone is covering the same alt timeline event, I think they can have vastly different outcomes in the story. So definitely a fun one, especially if, like me, you do like the sci-fi-ish stuff. The Gate of Time is a uh, pretty strange one. So during World War II, a Native American pilot, Two Hawks, is in the military and is involved in an air raid in Romania. He gets shot down and he ejects from the plane with his parachute. And as he's floating down, he begins to feel dizzy, he begins to feel strange. And then he lands, he is rescued and harbored by some local people, and then he begins to realize that these people don't really look like Romanians, and they don't speak like Romanians either. In fact, they speak and look a hell of a lot like him. Except he's in Romania, so what the hell? Well, it turns out that after he jumped from the airplane, he went through to an alternate timeline, because of course he did. And in this timeline, the entire American continent just doesn't exist. This is a map of the world in this timeline, and as you can see, no America. So since America never existed, the Native Americans never actually went over there through the Bering Strait, and so they instead migrated west into Europe. And hence, that's why he finds these Native American looking people over here in Romania instead of the non-existent America. And I'm not really sure that's how genes or evolution works, but we'll just go with it. Now, a bunch of the names and peoples of these countries and areas and populations are obviously quite a bit different but I'll just go over the layout in general terms, or in the closest way that resembles our timeline and countries and people. In this timeline, as I said, the Native American people roughly occupy Romania and Ukraine, Greece was colonized by the Hittites, and in turn, Italy was colonized by the Greeks. The natives up in Canada in our timeline instead occupy roughly Czechoslovakia, and the Aztecs instead occupy modern-day Russia, and Japan here is called Saraset and is mostly Finnish, as well as just loads and loads of other differences. Now, Two Hawks quite quickly learns that even though the entire world is different and the American continent doesn't exist, nevertheless, Germany is starting a war on everyone. Which, I mean, classic Germany and some things apparently never change. Although Germany in this timeline isn't inhabited by Germans, it's inhabited by Lithuanians. So, I guess some things do change. Bloody Lithuanians. Your kauju, milu lietuvius. And due to the entire continent not existing, everything that developed and was invented on the continent also never existed. This includes horses, tobacco, turkeys, 
even camels, rubber, and chocolate. Like, damn, no chocolate. Two Hawks goes on a bunch of adventures, explores all parts of the world, where instead of just America and its people just, you know, not existing, they instead kind of do exist, but just are squished into the other parts of the world. So it's kind of an interesting concept. I don't know how realistic that would be, but it is a really fun one nonetheless. Fire on the Mountain covers a super interesting part of history that I am only just now learning about, and that is of John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. And it in itself was a completely nutso event. So this guy, John Brown, was in 1859 a northern abolitionist with a plan. You could even say with a plot. He was a scheming kind of individual. And this plot, which he actually mostly followed through with, was to rent out a house and some land quite nearby the US Armory, which housed a bunch of the US weaponry arsenal. And this armory was in Harper's Ferry in West Virginia. Now at the time it was just Virginia, it wasn't West Virginia, but the plan was to set up a base just a few miles away in this home, in this surrounding land, and secretly come down with a bunch of people pretend like they were setting up a business of sorts there to do with like drilling or mining and just slowly bring weapons down from the north, arm a bunch of these individuals and then in the dead of night all march onto the armory, take it by force, take a bunch of the weapons and slowly march from farm to farm in all of the southern states, freeing the slaves there handing them weapons, and so as he went, he would slowly grow his army of, you know, armed slaves. Then eventually this militia and thousands of slaves, all armed with guns and pikes and spears, would basically be unstoppable and they would liberate the entire south. At least that was for the most part the plan. This was just before the civil war actually took place and it was thought that things were kind of ramping up and so by doing this and freeing a ton of the slaves, this might make the south look a little bit silly, take away a bunch of their power and kind of win the civil war for the north before the war even started. In reality, what happened is they took way too long raiding the armory, nowhere near enough slaves joined their ranks, or at least fast enough, and the reaction from the government was way too fast, they got in over their heads and it ended up in a massive holdout and shootout. And this actually was one of the events that kind of ended up sparking the civil war, as the north saw John Brown as kind of like a revolutionary fighting for the freedom of slaves, and so that ramped them up a little bit. And the South saw this as an attack on their lifestyle, an attack on their country and their property, and they were convinced the North would continue doing this and in greater numbers. So that ramped them up to defend the South, essentially. And then, less than two years after this, the Civil War was started. It's a really cool piece of history, I think, that you can read about here and there. But this alternate history, Fire on the Mountain, explores a timeline in which this this raid on the armory was actually successful. In our timeline, John Brown asked a bunch of people to join his attack, and these ranged from political figures to strategists, and a bunch of them said no, either it was too risky, or that it wouldn't work, or they just didn't want to. And one of the people who said no was an ex-slave by the name of Harriet Tubman. Except in this alternate history, she actually said yes. And by joining the raid with her keen insight and strategic mind, this actually resulted in the raid being a success. So instead of the American Civil War, there is a war fought between the abolitionists and the black slaves, and they eventually win that war, forming their own union in the South named Nova Africa. John Brown doesn't survive in this alternate timeline either, which might be quite fitting as when he was asked in our timeline about, you know, what the odds of survival were, if this was a wise choice to make, he said that the success rate of the raid would probably be around 10%, but he said there are moments when men can do more dead than alive. So these former slave states, Nova Africa, become eventually socialist. Abe Lincoln actually starts a war with Nova Africa to try and get these ceded states back into the United States. And this ends up failing, black people end up hating Abe Lincoln for this, and Nova Africa eventually becomes a bastion of technology, of science, of education, even going so far as to develop a space program and in landing people on Mars. And this new nation is basically 
painted as a socialist utopia where everyone is free, everyone is super happy, the quality of life is super high, and everyone, you know, gets what they're given whenever they need it. And in this alternate timeline, there is a book which kind of explores an alternate within an alternate timeline. And this alternate alternate timeline is basically our timeline, which sorry if that was confusing, but this book within the alt timeline is called John Brown's Body. And it explores a crazy world where John Brown's raid was unsuccessful and America ended up having a civil war in which the South lost. Lincoln ended up freeing the slaves and abolishing slavery. And in this new capitalistic hypothetical world, things are just absolutely awful. Which, I mean, there's often no real way of telling what would have been a better outcome in these scenarios. But it is still a really super cool piece of history that I never knew about before reading this timeline. And I do quite like these little tidbits. Player 2 start. Not to be confused with Ready Player 2, but this timeline explores something that almost went through in our timeline, that being the Nintendo Sony CD-ROM console. So it's time for a little video game history. In the late 1980s, Nintendo was huge. They obviously had consoles like the NES, the SNES, and these consoles all at the time used cartridges for their games. But there was this new up and coming technology that was fairly popular at the time for storing music and might possibly be able to be used for video games. That was the CD. So Nintendo kind of guessed that it might be possible to use it for this and kind of saw that maybe this is where the future of video games was going. And so enter a company named Sony. Now they weren't really in the video game console business at all. They were mostly producing and inventing audio based products such as the audio chip for the SNES, which was at the time basically one of the best on the entire market. So Sony knew what they were doing when it came to audio stuff. And actually the name Sony partly comes from the Latin Sonus, meaning sound. We actually get the word sound, sonic, etc. from Sonus. So Sony approached Nintendo with a proposal. They said, look, we are very good at what we do. We're very good with CDs. We reckon we can make a video game console that actually runs the games on CDs instead of cartridges. But we don't have the infrastructure. We don't have the reach in the industry. So they asked to do a collaboration basically with Nintendo where they would make firstly an add-on to the SNES that allowed whoever already owned an SNES to you know just plug it in and enable them to play both CD games and NES games and to make an additional standalone console that was co-made by Sony and Nintendo and played both CD games and Nintendo cartridges. So it was a huge project and would have made massive ripples in the industry but at the time Nintendo thought that Sony was taking a little more from the deal than they should have been and so the deal ended up falling through. So this console was never made. Philips, who was another company that was in talks with Nintendo for a console like this, that deal ended up falling through as well and Philips later came out with their CDI which was a massive failure. But a few years later Sony came out with their standalone console, the PlayStation 1, which was really the first major successful CD console. And Nintendo themselves wouldn't come out with a CD-based console for another six years in 2001. And that was, of course, the GameCube. So yeah, if this deal didn't fall through, we potentially could have seen a Nintendo CD console as early as 10 years before they actually released a CD console. And this alternate timeline basically explores that possibility. And in this timeline, there is a Sony Nintendo partnership basically as far up as the 2010s. Sega as a company is still actually in the mix although they're just kind of barely holding on and because this Sony Nintendo partnership is really so strong this leads to other companies such as Microsoft, Apple and Bandai all basically combining or working with each other in some way or another in order to defeat this mega force of Nintendo and Sony. So a pretty cool timeline and a really really cool piece of of history that uh, yeah any self-respecting nerd should know. The footprint of Mussolini. So this explores a timeline in which before and during World War II, Mussolini, the dictator of Italy, doesn't end up siding with Germany. This is due to during an assassination attempt on Mussolini, one of his guards ends up jumping in front of him, basically giving his life for Mussolini and for Italy. And as he's dying, as Mussolini's talking to the guy, he finds out that he is a Jewish 
Englishman. And so, since he owes this Jew his life, he says he can't possibly side with Hitler and with Germany. He then goes on to push for the Jews of Italy being as much Italian as the actual Italians. And so, when World War II happens, he just kind of stays out of the war. And while Germany is occupied, he uses this as an opportunity to, with the help of a bunch of other European states, invade Yugoslavia. They end up quite easily taking over Yugoslavia, dividing it up between these various countries, and this whole thing leads to a few major changes in the timeline, one of which being South Africa becoming a fully legally white supremacist country, which yeah, scary stuff. Zhirinovsky's Russian Empire. So Zhirinovsky was, well, he was a freaking nutcase. He was a presidential candidate and politician in Russia in the 1990s, and he just had some insane views and vows and promises for if he got elected. He said that if he gets elected, everyone in the country will get free vodka and free underwear. Okay, maybe he's not so bad after all. But he also hated Jews, preached about the supremacy of the white race. He started throwing rocks at protesters one time and also promised that if he got elected, he would enact and enforce a police state and start having immediate mass executions. So yeah, maybe the free underwear isn't really worth it. He wanted to kick all Muslims out of the country, all of the Japanese and Chinese out of the East side of Russia and to basically do away with democracy and install a dictatorship in which the leader of this dictatorship would be chosen by the wisest five or six thousand people which that doesn't seem like it can be corrupted at all and he also wanted to go back to the imperial flag and national anthem so yeah just an extreme guy and of course this entry explores a world in which he somehow gets elected to the presidential position and is involved in some brutal events some genuine war crimes, and eventually there is a coup which arrests Zhirinovsky and removes him from power and has him, you know, charged for some of his war crimes in a court, which thank god. Much of the early part of this timeline is written in the form of these accounts, mostly as I said of the court and trial accounts and, you know, the subsequent sentencing. So not the best leader for Russia, I guess you could say, but free underwear and vodka might be kind of close. I am kidding, by the way. This guy was just the worst. And he died in 2022, so we won't have to worry about this timeline coming to fruition. Disaster at Leuton. So this one takes us back to something called the Four Years' War, which was a war that lasted four years, obviously, from 1756 to 1760. It was fought between the Prussians and the Austrians, and in our timeline, the Prussians won quite handily, especially considering they were actually outnumbered two to one. But in this timeline, it explores a world in which the Austrians actually win, as the King of Prussia, Friedrich II, ends up falling off his horse, dying, and all the morale is basically lost for the entire army, and it breaks down and they end up losing this battle. And so the Prussians surrender, France and Spain basically teams up against Britain, and they make an attempt to take some of the colonies from the British. So France and Spain start building up their armies around the colonies in North America. Meanwhile, France takes a huge part of its army and navy and basically puts it near the border, like near the coastline facing Britain, basically forcing Britain to take a bunch of its soldiers and a bunch of its equipment and ships, etc., from all over the world and bring it back to defend Britain. This obviously leaves a large part of the empire underdefended, and so France ends up maintaining a large part of North America. And since the French never end up selling Louisiana in the Louisiana Purchase, they still own this huge part of the country. There are multiple wars that have happen between like Texas and Mexico and Canada in the north and the newly formed California and the United States of America basically never ends up happening, at least to the extent that it does in our timeline. And the majority of North America is owned by Canada, Louisiana, and California. Oh, and Karl Marx, who is Karl Brandt in this timeline, preaches for German nationalism and patriotism, which is a bit of a strange detail in this timeline. But as you know, I do like timelines like this, where there are some major, major changes, all stemming from a single, relatively small event of a man falling off his horse 
force 300 years ago, the Thousand Week Reich. So as we all know, when Hitler came to power, he envisioned something called the Thousand Year Reich, or Thousand Year Rule essentially, where Hitler's vision would basically rule for a thousand years. But in this alternate timeline, which I think is a very realistic timeline, Germany does win World War II, and so they take a bunch of Europe, Africa, etc. But they really do have trouble holding on to it, and so their Reich only lasts a thousand weeks instead of a thousand years. A thousand weeks being like 20 years or so. As with a lot of these World War II based timelines, it starts with Germany and Britain signing a peace treaty or peace agreement. And because they've taken over France, because they're no longer fighting Britain, they're able to put a lot more of their forces into fighting the Soviets. And so Germany basically wins everything. But there are constant uprisings, especially all over Eastern Europe. Britain and America are in constant talks about fighting back against Germany and taking back power and land. And Russia and some of its surrounding countries countries are also planning some sort of resurgence. So yeah, once again, they've won, but how long can they hold on to this power? There's also a civil war that ends up happening in Germany between the pro Goering faction and the pro Himmler faction. So yeah, I think an interesting timeline. And I like more realistic ones like this, where you'd think if Germany takes on basically the entire world, they might have some trouble holding on to it all, which doesn't always get addressed in timelines like this. But I'm glad it did in this one. Battle Royale was was actually one of my favorite films growing up and it is based in 1997 in Japan where Japan is this super fascist extreme government and they go by the name of the Republic of Greater East Asia after winning World War II. This government is kind of like 1984 and they control everything about their society. They control the styles of clothes people wear, the music they listen to and stuff like listening to pro western music is severely punished and the main driving point I guess about this story is that to kind of flex their power and to keep their citizens in line the government takes 50 classes of high school students knocks them all out with gas and takes them to this remote island and forces them to basically kill each other when they wake up they are given weapons they are given supplies and they have these collars on them that if they don't kill each other if they don't cooperate in this etc the collars will just explode and kill them anyway so this whole thing sounds a little similar to this this other film series that I quite love. And those books are fantastic, by the way, if you haven't read the book version of them. But anyway, all of that happens. They put them onto the island and the items they give the kids are kind of very random. Like a bunch of them are weapons, knives and guns, etc. There are a bunch of defensive ones or kind of quirky ones like bulletproof vests, stab proof vests, or a device that can actually track other students, which is kind of a cool tactical tool, I guess. Or even questionable weapons like boomerang, or forks, which if someone else is getting a machine gun and you're getting a fork, you have really drawn the short straw on that one. But yeah, some pretty cool stuff. It comes in film and book versions, and it is probably borderline horror, if not actually technically horror, but the concept itself is pretty interesting. I won't spoil the ending for this one, but I would definitely, definitely recommend checking out either the book or the film. Command and Conquer Red Alert. So this timeline results in something quite realistic, I'd say. But if you do want realism, you'll have to just maybe forgive the start of this, as it does begin with Einstein traveling back in time 20 years to meet a young Hitler. So yeah, he goes back in time, he meets young Hitler, they talk for a little bit, end up shaking hands, and as soon as they touch, Hitler disappears. Just time travel things, I guess. And so without Hitler, Germany never really has its uprising or starts World War II. And because Germany is weaker, the Soviets end up basically growing more powerful and pushing for more control over Europe. They invade parts of Asia, India, and Europe. And since the Europeans just won't stand for this, basically the whole remainder of the rest of Europe ends up forming a coalition to fight back against the Soviets. So yeah, as I said, the outcome is probably quite realistic if we do allow for a little bit of time traveling Einstein. Easternized World is a really cool one, I think, and it explores a world where instead of the West basically developing faster than everyone else and then conquering and invading Asia, America, Africa, etc., like they did, instead of that, the East actually does that. So the divide in this timeline starts off with the Tang Dynasty, and the Tang Dynasty just lasts slightly longer and is slightly more powerful than in our timeline. This results in the 
Chinese being stronger, in them defeating the Mongolians, and in them capturing a bunch of Asia. Then the Japanese and the Indonesians become great colonial powers of their own. And so instead of the British and French and Spanish colonizing different parts of the world, you instead have the Japanese, Chinese, and Indonesians, where you have the majority of Americans speaking either Chinese or Japanese, as you know, they kind of got there first and colonized America. And you have Japan invading Britain and the Netherlands. And as you can see from this map, the entire world looks quite a bit different to our timeline. And eventually, as with our own timeline and the large empires that it used to be, they slowly break down, Japan and China kind of lose control over these places. Not fully, but they don't have the absolute control they used to do. So yeah, a pretty cool and interesting change in perspective for an easternized world. The War That Came Early series. So this is a novel by Harry Turtledove, and it explores a world in which World War II goes vastly different. It starts off with Jose San Jorjo not dying in a plane crash as he did in our timeline, but instead with him going on to successfully win the Spanish War and take power. Spain joins up with the Axis powers in World War II, which ends up starting a year earlier than it actually did, and Germany ends up invading Czechoslovakia instead of Poland, and Poland actually ends up making friends with Germany. France never ends up getting fully invaded, Winston Churchill gets assassinated, and so this weakens Britain and ends up with Britain and France joining Germany and going after the USSR. So this timeline is just like a mess. America then pulls out of supporting Britain and France, as you know, Britain and France are kind of best buds with Germany now. And then after all this, there is a coup in Britain, which leads to the leadership changing and with Britain flipping sides again against Germany. And France follows suit, so now you have them on the good side again. As I said, this timeline is all over the place. So now you have kind of what you had in our timeline, except the US isn't in the war, they haven't yet developed nuclear weapons, Germany is super strong, and it ends basically with Hitler's assassination, and with most of the countries in the war signing a peace treaty. Since Germany was never defeated, they are still allowed a military, quite a strong military, and they're allowed to mostly keep Czechoslovakia. And, and, they also might be the first country to develop nuclear weapons, which is always what you want to hear. So yeah, very scary stuff in this timeline, tons of flip-flopping, which I'm not sure that would happen in a realistic timeline, although you never can tell with these things. But regardless, it is a fantastic six-book series, which you can pick up if you're looking for things to do on a rainy day. Code Geass is an anime with a pretty interesting alternate timeline. So to start off with, King Henry VIII actually had a son who became King Henry IX, and this actually results in them losing the Battle of Trafalgar to Napoleon. So after losing to Napoleon, Elizabeth III has to basically give up the British Isles to Napoleon, and she flees to the American colonies and to Canada. And here she forms the Britannian Empire. And so that was all in the past and in the modern day in this timeline. You have basically three superpowers in the world. You have the Britannian Empire, which covers basically the Americas, the Chinese Federation, which is the majority of Asia, and Europa United, which is basically all of Europe and Africa. Britannia develops a bunch of cool new tech, like autonomous armored knights, which just sounds freaking cool. And with it, they successfully invade Japan and strip all of their citizens of all of their rights, which is pretty messed up. They also rename Japan as Area 11, and the Japanese people vow secretly to work towards taking Japan back and to one day defeat the Britannian invaders. It's a pretty cool anime, and I think the major point of divergence was Britain losing the Battle of Trafalgar. And while Britain may very well have lost that battle, I don't know if that would have resulted in France taking the British Isles, but who knows? We the Happy Few takes place in a alternate reality where FDR was actually assassinated in 1933. In our reality, this attempt actually failed, but here it succeeds, Huey Long becomes president, the US doesn't join World War II, and as a result, Britain loses the battle against Germany, and the British Isles get invaded. And now, Britain is fully invaded, fully conquered, but the citizens in this small island town, roughly 
here, commit a certain act. Now, it's not exactly revealed what this act was, but the act was apparently so heinous and so horrible and so evil that the Germans just leave them to their own on this small little island. They don't want anything to do with these people on here. And so the citizens of Wellington Wells are free to live here. It's basically like an autonomous island and they are free from German control as the Germans, as I said, don't want anything to do with them. And because of this unnamed act that they committed, everyone on this island feels this immense sorrow and anguish and guilt. Everyone's just anxious and hateful and depressed. And so they invented this new medicine, shall we say, called joy. And joy makes people absurdly joyful, happy, excited, and content pretty much all the time. It also takes away any and all bad memories, and it, like most medicines, obviously has side effects that include, but are not limited to, evil devilish hallucinations, loss of appetite, short-term memory loss, and massive addiction. So yeah, not very fun. Over the next 20 years in isolation, Wellington Wells develops a bunch of super, super cool tech, such as quirky electric laser guns, advanced power systems, advanced security systems, and they use most of this tech to create, ironically, basically a police state on the island where they monitor all of their citizens, they track them all, and they pump joy into the water supply and basically force all of their citizens to take it all of the time. And those that don't are... As if that wasn't bad enough, they also make everyone wear these white face masks, which force people's mouths up into a permanent smile. And yeah, it's just all sorts of dystopian. It seems like a very, very cool universe and game that I will absolutely look into actually playing, maybe on a stream someday. But this entire thing basically started with the actions of one five foot unemployed bricklayer. So yeah, terrifying stuff, but probably makes for a pretty fun game. Original War is a very strange one, but it is a very cool concept that explores a world in which in 1919, in Russia, near the Tunguska explosion site, which is actually an event I covered in my Unsolved Mysteries iceberg, so go and check that out if you like. Super cool, potentially alien UFO event. But this device that was found was an alien device that did a very specific task, and that was whatever was placed inside of this device was transported back in time hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah, spooky. But it ran on this strange alien fuel that was only found inside the device, and so once it ran out, that was basically it. They couldn't really use the device anymore, and they just put it away into storage. Until in 2010, some more of this fuel was found in the form of this previously undiscovered ore. And this ore was subsequently named Siberite, because it was obviously found in Siberia. And so, once again, they were able to use this strange alien device. Now, this part does involve time travel, so it does get a tiny bit confusing, but it also gets very, very fun. So, in this original timeline. The Americans are in possession of this device, and this fuel is also, as well as being the fuel for this alien device, it is also an incredibly good and high energy resource. So think of it like a better version of striking oil. So the Americans, since they have the device, they power up the device, go back in time hundreds of thousands of years, and they discover that a ton of this ore is just kind of everywhere. Like, I guess it had been depleted over the years, but all the way back in this year, it is somewhat of a common resource. So what the Americans do is, since this is only really found in Siberia, they go back in time, take a ton of this ore, and actually move it over the Bering Strait into Alaska. And so, by the time the future comes, there is an alternate reality within this alternate reality in which, in America, since they moved all of the ore over, the Americans find tons of this ore and as a result, they are super, super successful as a nation. So hopefully this is making sense so far. Think of it kind of like a time-traveling heist. So in this new timeline, the Russians are kind of sad because America is so powerful. And because the Americans always had this resource and never really needed the device, it's actually the Russians who end up discovering the device in Siberia in this timeline. And when they excavate the device, they find evidence that, hey, hundreds of thousands of years ago, a 
Americans were here digging up ores and moving it over to America. So they think something very strange is going on here. So what ends up happening is they then take the device and go back in time to when the Americans originally went back in time. And so back here you have the Americans and you have the Russians, all fighting for control over this ancient resource. And so you have, you know, the earliest Russo-American war, otherwise known as the original war. So a super cool story and concept, I think. I do especially love a lot of them that involve time travel, and it does also seem like a pretty cool and fun real-time strategy game. But if you are looking for a hyper-realistic alternate timeline, this probably isn't the one for you. Death of a President was a documentary made about the assassination of George W. Bush. Now this didn't happen, obviously, but this is what we call a future history history docudrama, which sounds fun and it is basically making a documentary about something that hasn't even happened yet, as if it did actually happen. So this documentary is obviously after the assassination takes place, and Bush is shot with a sniper rifle while giving a speech in Chicago. Dick Cheney then obviously becomes president, there's this Syrian guy who is accused of being the assassin, even though the evidence supporting that is kind of flimsy, but he is eventually sentenced to death, his crime just being Syrian, I guess. And we eventually find out that the most likely suspect for this assassination is the father of a US soldier who died in the Iraq war. And so he blames obviously Bush for starting the war and for sending his son there. And they actually find evidence in this dad's house of a copy of a top secret itinerary that basically explained exactly where President George Bush would be on that specific date. So I'm Sure, there's no conspiracy here. What are you even talking about? Arrest them. Like, none whatsoever. And of course, Dick Cheney pushes for Americans to have less freedom by basically extending the Patriot Act and considers just considers invading Syria, because why not? More wars. So yeah, a very likely outcome, I think, if something like this were to actually happen. But thankfully, it never actually did. And so we averted at least some of this timeline. Tier 10, Agent of Byzantium. So this is another alt history by who else than Harry Turtledove. In this specific timeline, Prophet Muhammad doesn't start Islam. Instead, he becomes a Christian, a very important Christian mind. But the point is that Islam doesn't exist. And because Islam doesn't exist, the Byzantium and Sassanid Persian empires end up surviving. In our reality, these were both basically lost due to Muslim invasion. But here, Islam never existed, and so both of these empires remained and flourished. Even the Jurchen people of roughly China, end up pushing outwards into Siberia and then more west, which they never actually did in our timeline. And I'm guessing this is due to, once again, the lack of a threat of a Muslim empire. And this story kind of reads like an ancient spy novel sort of thing, as it follows these two essentially spies working across the Byzantium and the Sassanid empires. Very cool one, once again, from Harry Turtledove. Roma Eterna is an alt history where the Roman Empire never actually fell. In this history, Moses and his people never really actually left Egypt. Most of them ended up probably drowning. And as a result, Judaism, at least how we know it today, never really took off. It remained basically a small religion practiced by a small amount of Hebrews in this specific area in Egypt. And so, obviously, Yeshua or Jesus never had his revelations. And so, Christianity was never born. And Muhammad did try to start Islam, but he was killed off early on by a Roman agent. So Islam, Christianity, both don't exist, and they are probably the two most influential religions in the last 2000 years in our timeline. So without them, the Roman Empire was never Christianized and seemingly never collapsed. They later reverted or progressed, depending on how you see it, back to a Roman Republic, which in my eyes was probably the best version of Rome. And this old timeline basically describes our modern world, but with a super dominant modern Roman Republic. It covers their heavy domination in Europe, in parts of Asia, and in their attempts to conquer America. So a bit of a strange timeline, and you'd expect it to be massively different due to the lack of Christianity and Islam, but it seems to be mostly the same except for these few changes. And it ends, as crazy as it seems, with a bunch of Hebrews in Alexandria, leaving Earth on a rocket to try and find the promised land in space, apparently. And as the rocket is flying up, it just 
blows up mid-flight. So yeah, crazy timeline. Island in the Sea of Time. So this is an alt history written by S.M. Sterling, who wrote another alt history in our last episode. But in this timeline, the entire island of Nantucket and this nearby US Coast Guard ship both get transported back in time roughly 3,000 years ago. So obviously everyone on the island of Nantucket and on the boat are just freaking out. The police chief starts organizing things, starts taking control, starts getting people to, you know, rally around, collect supplies, collect wood, etc. And the ship ends up making plans to sail to the UK in order to, I guess, secure more resources, potentially trade some things with the people. And I know it wasn't technically the UK back then, but you know, this island basically. And a cool part of this story is that they took with them on the ship firstly a Lithuanian and secondly a historian who spoke ancient Greek. And ancient Greek is obviously very useful if you're in ancient Greece. And Lithuanian is actually surprisingly thought to be quite similar to this proto-Indo-European language that was spoken roughly back then. And the origins of pretty much all of our European languages come from that, even though we don't know what the language actually was. But I do really like that detail. The captain of the ship ends up basically getting googly eyes for power and he thinks, hey, because we're in this ancient time with all of this modern advanced technology, I can basically become a king. And so his first plan is obviously to take over Nantucket because then he'd have access to all of the modern technology and resources and stuff. And so while he's over here in the British Isles, he starts basically amassing an army of these ancient people. And then there's eventually this huge battle. The captain is eventually defeated and he ends up escaping to Greece which we can only imagine what he'd be doing over there he wants to take over power he has someone who speaks ancient Greek you do the math so more of an interesting time travel story I'd say than an alt history but still very fun nonetheless. Hako Ichiu explores a Japan in the 20th century where some of the more moderate liberal people managed to win power over the imperialists. It's an interesting dynamic as just like in our timeline there was basically a three-way struggle for power in Japan between the basically civilian Japanese government and the navy and the army and especially between the latter two as the navy and the army were always fighting each other in almost a cold war sort of way where they would sometimes sabotage each other's plans and they would always have different plans about where to invade and where to go. The navy wanted to invade the colonies in Asia for example and the army wanted to invade China. The navy wanted to attack America and the army wanted to attack Russia and so many many things are different in this timeline as a result of these different liberal people getting control in Japan. One of the things that's different is that Britain and America and Japan don't really fight in World War I for that long and China is absolutely decimated into these relatively small capitals and countries. So China as a whole is no longer united. This is a very very interesting one but it is on the alternate history website so tons of details. The alteration asks the very simple question, I'd say, of what would the world look like if the Reformation had never taken place? Now, the Reformation, for those who don't know, is in our timeline, basically the popularization of Protestantism. That is, going against the abuses, shall we say, of the Catholic Church way back in the day. So at this time, there was growing sentiment that the Catholic Church was just abusing their power, and they were doing stuff like indulgences, where you could buy basically a get-out-of-hell free card. So you've committed a crime, you've committed a sin, you're going to hell, and then you pay the church off basically, and they forgive your sins for you. And this was seen as a massive money grab at the time, and not really how forgiving works, as surely you'd have to repent for your sins and God would have to forgive you. You don't just pay money to someone else and they forgive you. So there was a lot of problems with the church at this time. And so Protestantism was kind of born and became really popular as a protest to the Catholic Church. And they believed in a smaller church, in you having a more direct connection with God and with the Bible and with Jesus, as opposed to with priests and with the church and with their rules. But in this alternate timeline, Martin Luther, who was a big part of Protestantism actually taken off, not to be confused with Martin Luther King, by the way, but he at a young age basically buys into the Catholic Church and becomes a minister and then eventually becomes the Pope. And so the Catholic Church never really faces an uprising or an opposition and 
and so they are a lot more powerful. England is basically a militant theocracy and is pretty much just ruled by the church. Ireland is West England, which how horrible. And Scotland is North England, which I mean, that one's fine. The church now kind of headed by the Vatican rules all of Italy and they have a fairly large empire. Much of science and scientific advancements are banned, which includes electricity by the way, because I mean, yeah, why not? Let's just use candles for eternity. Like, just why? So, yeah, maybe a potential possible realistic outcome of the Catholic Church if they were never kept in check. Decades of Darkness is an alternate timeline where Thomas Jefferson dies of a heart attack fairly early on in the revolutionary period. And after this happens, James Madison basically takes over. And he does not do a great job at, well, anything. The United States ends up losing a bunch of United States to some of the southern states who just leave to England and to some of the northeastern states. There is also a massive Indian confederation that gets founded and the US never really becomes and this is all down to poor management and to poor relations and to starting needless wars at the wrong times and so because the United States lost a bunch of their northern territories the north what we think of as the north is a lot weaker in this timeline than the south and so this leads to them never having a civil war and to the country being basically run by the south. Slavery ends up being legal for quite a lot longer than it is in our timeline. America ends up invading Mexico and a few other countries in South America. It takes back Texas, it invades Puerto Rico, Honduras, the French Caribbean and basically has aims to unite or conquer the entire American continent under the United States. And as you can see from this map in the 1930s of this timeline, they make one hell of an attempt at doing so. Europe looks a hell of a lot different than it does in our timeline, thanks to mostly Germany just being Germany. And these sorts of timelines just really makes you think about how unstable and not certain the early days of the United States was, and how many political decisions that they made that so easily could have gone wrong that would have resulted in a vastly, vastly different United States. What madness is this? Is a really cool name. So this explores America once again in a timeline where the Federalist Party tries to basically make a power grab of the country and in doing so they irreparably corrupt it and damage it and this leads to the collapse of America and the American system. And overseas Napoleon ends up conquering all of Europe and in America with the USA collapsed a new power rises up the Republican Union and they are fascist as all get out. There are ongoing fights between them and some of the remaining southern states like Maryland, Georgia, etc. And it results in a vastly more corrupt and dark United States, or at least what's left of it, Europe, and basically the entire world than in our timeline. Toyotomi Japan. So this covers the death, sadly, of a really cool dude. And that dude is Yi Sun Sin, who was a Korean admiral and general who basically fought off the Japanese for years. He is regarded as one of Korean's best admirals, if not one of the best admirals ever of all time. And he was basically single-handedly responsible for defending Korea against the Japanese in the early days. And so in this timeline, he unfortunately dies prior to the Japanese invasion, and the Koreans are subsequently pretty easily defeated. Japan then invades Korea, which gives them kind of like a confidence boost, I guess. And this leads to Japan, instead of being isolationist, to them being more expansionist, and in choosing to expand Japan into new territories and areas. And so, because this happened quite early on in the 1500s, you know, before the Europeans had really conquered or explored the majority of America. In this timeline, Japan conquers a bunch of southeastern territories, as well as places like Siberia, Alaska, and the American West Coast. And as you can see from this map, the United States that we all know and love, or some of us know and love, is basically non-existent. And with this really small, super early change, Japan goes from this relatively tiny island to being a worldwide empire. So, Pretty cool timeline. The Aztec Empire asks the question of 
what if the Aztecs had actually defeated Cortes in the 1500s when he came over to say hi? And I'm sure that's all that happened. Well, in this timeline, they did defeat him and they took all of his cool tech, like his guns, like his horses, and they rapidly started an empire of their own. So pretty early on, they work out those little flaws like cannibalism and human sacrifice and build up their country into a fairly strong nation that has pretty, pretty good relations with America. So because they had guns pretty early on and they started their civilization before the rest of the Europeans arrived, when the United States was being formed and like the French and Spanish were all over there, they weren't really able to conquer or attack the Aztecs as they were quite formidable on their own. So the Aztecs actually ended up supporting the United States in their war of independence as they thought it would be good to have an American nation up north above them as opposed to these constant European people attacking them. And I know the Americans, you know, were Europeans, but instead of it being a British ruled colony or French or Spanish, the Aztecs thought if these people identify themselves as American and not really European, they would probably have better relations with them. And they weren't wrong. So the Aztecs basically become a modern empire. They westernize themselves, they modernize themselves, they develop new tech and an army and a government, and they actually take over what is now Mexico. And they also help America take over Canada. And the Aztecs and the Americans are just like best buds, two super powerful nations right next to each other, and they are apparently very respectful of each other and of their borders. The Incan Empire, which is just to the south of the Aztecs, is really quite a bit weaker and they're in a more desperate position definitely than the Aztecs are. The Incans basically end up teaming up with Germany and after they lose World War I, the Incan nation is just completely decimated. And so because they are such a failing nation, they're so poor, everyone's starving, when World War II comes around, the Incans turn fascist because why not? And they end up joining the Axis powers. So zero out of two so far. America and the Aztecs end up teaming teaming up again, which they're like the A-team at this point, and they defeat the Axis powers, they defeat the Incans, and that's basically the entire timeline. It is a really cool twist, I think, having another nation that advanced so early on in the Americas, as I think if they were any weaker as a civilization, they would have been conquered and invaded like they were in our timeline, but a very fun one nonetheless. Assassin's Creed 3, The Tyranny of King Washington is, well, you can probably guess from the title, it is a DLC for Assassin's Creed. Creed 3, where you basically have to defeat a deranged George Washington. And so I guess the point of divergence in this timeline is that George Washington finds this alien artifact, which is the Apple of Eden, and by using it, it basically corrupts his mind and creates an alternate reality out of his corrupted mind and nightmares. So yeah, crazy stuff. And in this alternate dream reality, George Washington is the ultimate and supreme leader and king of the United States, and he is absolutely bonkers. It is an Assassin's Creed game, so it involves some crazy conspiracies, it involves sneaking around, invisibility, obviously assassinations. It also, due to its era, involves a bunch of people from around that time, like Benedict Arnold, Benjamin Franklin, and Samuel Adams. This entire story is just like a massive acid trip or something, and for me, it was super fun to read through, and if you do like Assassin's Creed stuff, definitely probably pick it up as a DLC, but if you are a massive fan of of Assassin's Creed, you probably already have it. And it ends with Washington building a freaking pyramid in New York. And then both you and him are transported back to the original timeline, or not our original timeline, but you know, not the dream timeline. And Washington realizes that this artifact is super evil and corrupts him like mad. And he gives it to you in order to just take away and dispose of. So yeah, not at all a realistic timeline, but still a very, very fun game and story nonetheless. Homefront is an FPS game in which Kim Jong-un basically unites North and South Korea. He then, once it's all united, uses this to build up a massive empire over most of Asia. So yeah, pretty realistic outcome so far. He does seem like the mass invading type. There are massive wars in the Middle East in this timeline, which 
doesn't really change much. Korea launches a giant EMP strike over America, and when this shuts down America, at least temporarily, Korea then invades via the west coast. Which I don't know how likely that part is, but it's always a possibility, I guess. It also talks about a disease spreading across the world, killing millions of people, and this apparently happens or will happen in 2020, as the game was made in 2012. So that is an eerily suspicious prediction. Seems like a pretty fun game, I'm not too sure how realistic a Korean invasion of America would be, but as I said, you never know. Threads is a film made in 1984 that is an incredibly and terrifyingly realistic film or depiction of what a nuclear war might actually entail. So this one, if you are going to check it out, is not for the faint-hearted. In this timeline, there's sort of a cold war happening in Iran between the Soviets and between America, and this cold war soon becomes hot when nukes are eventually launched. A ton of Europe is nuked, a ton of Russia is nuked, and this story follows a young couple in England and during the attacks they lose a bunch of their council members, a bunch of their family members and neighbours. There are the explosions obviously, there is mass radiation after the explosions and then there are all the mass panicking, there's the food shortages, supply shortages, medicine shortages. Since a bunch of the doctors died there aren't enough doctors to go around to save people so they have to leave people out to die. There's too many bodies to bury so they they do like mass burnings in various buildings and over the years due to the nuclear war Britain loses like 90 to 95 percent of its population and there are some really really messed up things that happen that I won't go into but you can just imagine the worst crimes that we have here in our society except they happen a lot more violently a lot more brutally and a lot more frequently over in this crazy world people are extremely desperate the government turns totalitarian to try and, you know, get things under control. Children are born with various diseases and mutations, and basically everyone is starving to death. Definitely one of the more brutal entries on this list, and probably, honestly, shockingly realistic for a nuclear war, and it is something that should always, obviously, be avoided at all all costs. Nukes are not fun. Turning Point Fall of Liberty. So this is another FPS that focuses on the question of what if Churchill had died before World War II? Well, obviously Churchill was a major driving force for the British people and for the British army and sentiment at the time and was partly if not wholly responsible for Britain winning the war against the Germans. And so with him dead in this timeline, we just straight up lose World War II. Germany defeats France, then they defeat Britain, and then they invade pretty much all of Europe. They go on to invade Russia, which normally would be a bad idea, but because they've invaded everywhere else, they no longer need to fight on two fronts and so have a much more powerful force to defeat Russia with. Then they team up with Italy, they take a bunch of North Africa, then they invade the Middle East, then a bunch of Asia. They just won't stop these guys. And then they move to invade the United States along the East Coast with Japan invading along the west coast. And all of this was made possible obviously by Churchill dying and by Thomas Dewey being elected president in 1948 instead of Harry Truman. And Dewey for some reason trusted the Axis powers that they wouldn't invade America and so he never really prepared for an invasion, you know, training troops, producing resources and ammunition etc. And so America is woefully unprepared when they actually do invade. And it would definitely be an extremely hard task, if not impossible in some scenarios, to invade the United States on a land attack. But if there was ever a random mix of bad luck, bad decisions, and power differential for it to work, this might actually be it. Liverpool Fantasy is a very simple yet quite unique one. In this timeline, the Beatles, quite early on, end up splitting up, and so they never really form or become the Beatles that we know of. So the question is, what would the world look like if the Beatles had never really formed and become successful. Well, Paul McCartney now goes by the name Paul Montana, and he lives in Las Vegas and basically acts as a entertainer. George Harrison is now Father George, who is obviously a priest. John Lennon is an unemployed, depressed alcoholic, which, I mean, geez, that is harsh. And Ringo Starr is also basically just a bum, and he lives off his wife's money and just basically sits around all day with John Lennon, 
drinking. And John Lennon in this timeline is apparently cursed, what he calls the curse of the Lennon vision, in which he can see a reality in which the Beatles never split up. He can see all of the fame and success and girls that they would have got if they stuck together, which, I mean, it's crazy, right? And yeah, it's a pretty interesting, pretty unique one. And probably not what would have happened, I think, if the Beatles had split up earlier, as all of the members were pretty banging artists in their own rights. Not as good as the Beatles combined, obviously. But again, with these things and with artists and with the music industry, who really knows? The death of Russia basically takes place in a 1993 Russia, where a coup takes place by Vice President Alexander Rutskoy. And initially, it works and he gains power over Russia, but eventually ends up with Russia breaking down along its party and political lines and results in multiple wars between these groups and with some very brutal outcomes of these wars. And eventually, eventually, it results in the complete, almost, dissolution of Russia, at least the Russia we've known for the last thousand years or so. So yeah, a pretty interesting one, like with these American ones, where the entirety of the United States ends up breaking up into multiple countries. This is kind of in a similar vein and it would be a pretty strange world if like Russia was broken up into four different countries say but that is always a possibility with these extreme sorts of scenarios. World War 3 was this somewhat odd fictional documentary that was made in 1998 that described a Russian coup and where these coupists end up overthrowing Gorbachev and shooting a bunch of protesters in Berlin and these shootings eventually end up spurring on basically World War 3 because like fantastic that is all we need. So things kick off in Berlin, the UK and the US then move in to stop the Soviets taking over the whole of Germany and there are in the timeline attempts made for negotiations but hilariously and somewhat scarily Soshkin who is the Russian leader at the time throughout the entire meeting says one word and that is Nyet. So I don't think they want to negotiate anytime soon. So Russia starts an official land invasion of Germany, NATO pushes back against them and ends up winning, and they actually tell the Soviets that we don't want to invade Russia. We are only going to go as far as the end of Germany, but Russia doesn't believe them. Russia thinks that they're going to invade the whole of Russia and Moscow and they're going to lose it all. And so in a last ditch desperate attempt, the nukes are brought out. In the end, there is a Soviet missile detector that is malfunctioning because of course it is. And the Soviets actually think that NATO has fired a missile at them. And so they respond in kind with a full out nuclear war. And it is noted in this documentary that there are no accounts of what happened after this. Seeming because all of the records and civilization was wiped out from this war. So yeah, a very scary and probably quite realistic outcome. And between the Soviets and NATO, they have a stupid amount of nukes. And if any of these countries end up getting into the wrong hands, the wrong leadership, they end up making rash decisions, something like this could maybe potentially happen. And that in and of itself is a terrifying thought. By Dawn's Early Light is firstly a lyric in one of the best bangers since the 1400s and also is the name of this film in which just a bunch of irresponsible stuff happens. So firstly, some rebel Soviet Union officials, who apparently hate the Soviet Union, launch a nuclear attack at Donetsk in Ukraine from Turkey somehow. So the Soviet Union sees this, and so naturally they just fire a bunch of missiles at America. Then the Soviet leader has talks with the United States leader, and basically reveals that we had some rogue members of the Soviet Union that launched this nuke at Ukraine from a NATO member of Turkey. And so they basically say it was one big misunderstanding and tells the United States that, look, we're willing to accept a counterattack. Like, here are the options, basically. We can start a ceasefire now. You can launch a counterattack on us and kill roughly as many citizens as we killed. Like, so we're even Steven sort of thing. Or you can retaliate even more against us. And if you do that, we will start a full-blown nuclear war. So the president goes away with this. He's discussing it with one of his trusted colleagues. And then the Soviet Union launches another missile strike at the United States. So, and this plot is like 
super ADHD, so the president authorizes a full-out attack on the Soviet Union. Then they find out that the second Soviet attack wasn't actually against the United States, but rather it was against China because China had originally fired weapons at Russia. So yeah, this is all over the place. And then after all of this, when the president realizes his mistake, he tries to stop the full-out attack. But as he's doing this, a nuke goes off and knocks his helicopter out of the sky. So with the president now dead, the secretary of the interior becomes basically president. And he is just nutso. He is informed of all of the mistakes and misunderstandings that have happened. And still, he pushes forward for a full-blown nuclear war with the Soviet Union. But the president isn't actually dead. Like, plot twist. He was just assumed dead when his chopper went down, but now he's alive and he's trying to contact the acting president to try and call off this entire thing. But firstly, he can't get through to him, and then when he does actually get through to him, the acting president just says, no, this is a prank call, this is an imposter, and he just puts the phone down and then carries on with his full-on attack. And I won't spoil the ending, but interceptions are made, sacrifices are made, and the submarine missiles are stopped, but at what cost. A very hectic plot, and I know I say this with a bunch of these alternate timelines, but it does seem like a very realistic one, considering this is sometimes how negotiations and stuff end up going, with minor misunderstandings or assumptions or flippant actions taking place here and there, which just escalates and leads to full-out war. Dust 1947. So this is a pretty cool little board game, and it is set in a version of World War II where the Germans find an alien spacecraft, so all the cool stuff like ray guns, advanced mechs, advanced jetpacks, and just for good measure for some reason, zombies. At the point of this game, World War II is basically over, the world has three real superpowers, the Allies, the Axis powers, and the Soviet-Chinese coalition, and the world also has to deal with an up-and-coming power in Mesopotamia. And this up-and-coming power takes all of their power from the worshipping of Cthulhu. And so they're able to use, you know, otherworldly beings and demons, that sort of thing. So yeah, pretty wild stuff, not too realistic as an alternate timeline, but it is a super cool reality with some awesome aesthetics nonetheless. Not For Broadcast is a pretty cool little game that takes place in 1984 in Britain. A far left party takes over and Britain basically becomes a communist dictatorship. They nationalize a bunch of the large companies, they take everyone's property and everyone's wealth, and they don't allow freedom of expression or freedom of information or freedom of the press. So yeah, I love dictatorships. Super fun. This country is like hated by all the other countries. They are sanctioned, but then they just start nuking all of Europe and Europe just has to surrender to them, I guess. And then they're like, yeah, that's what I thought. So now they own all of Europe. You basically play the game as this guy in charge of these news broadcasts and you make these decisions during the broadcasts throughout the game, basically related to propaganda and to the government and and to this group of people protesting the government called Disrupt. It seems like a pretty cool game. You can live during the broadcasts, select which ads to play, you can block out or bleep out words, you can kind of control the narrative, decide which headlines to show and in what order, and all of this affects the outcome of the broadcast and of the story as a whole. So yeah, seems like a pretty fun, unique game. Speaking of games, we have the War Game, which isn't a game, but it is a documentary. Or rather a imagined documentary in an alternate timeline. And this one, once again, depicts roughly what a nuclear war might look like and or entail. It was produced in 1966, and this timeline starts with China invading South Vietnam, which the US sees as a threat, and so they authorize nuclear weapons to be used against China. And then the Soviets threaten to invade West Germany and Europe if the US doesn't take back their threat of a nuke. And the US obviously doesn't take back their threats, and so the Soviets and friends end up invading West Germany. And so, naturally, a massive war starts. Millions of people die, people are burnt alive due to the nukes, and this happens worldwide in England, in Europe, in the Soviet Union. Pregnancies end up either not going through, or the children are born with many, many mutations. People's life expectancy goes way down, there is a lack of food and medicine. It's pretty similar to that last documentary that we covered on roughly the same topic and it paints just a dark dark world where everyone is starving and dying and depressed and it is 
basically absolute hell. And once again, it is the result of a few minor flippant decisions by some moron politicians. And I'm starting to think more nuclear disarmament might be a good thing. But on a side note, I do really like these hyper-realistic documentaries and or films that depicted the aftermath of a nuclear war, especially back in the day in the 50s and the 60s, as I think a bunch of this technology was really quite new. And so it was really important to show the people and the politicians politicians and all of that, a really realistic scenario if something like a World War 3 ended up being fought with nuclear weapons. And these films might be somewhat partly the reason why we haven't had one to this day, and hopefully we never do. The Great Martian War 1913 to 1917. So this imagines a World War 1 where instead of fighting the Germans and friends, it ends up basically being the Earth versus these aliens. So yeah, in 1913 a bunch of Martians basically crash land on Earth and the Allies have to team up with the Germans and all of the Central Powers and basically every nation on Earth in order to defeat these aliens. The aliens have this super super cool advanced technology and they have these mechs that basically every night after these battles they skirt across the battlefield picking up metal and then they bring it back and they use this metal to build more weapons and to build more mechs. So a super cool piece of technology I think. It's just a shame it's not on our side. And because they're so advanced the aliens start to win quite handily. The nations of Earth start to slowly slowly lose power. The US joins the fight quite late which classic US and even with the US they are still losing quite badly and I mean they are fighting super advanced alien technology and weapons so that's to be expected probably and it looks like this is the end all hope is lost until someone discovers that these aliens are super susceptible to something called glanders which is a disease that's often seen in donkeys and horses but it can travel to other animals and to humans and the humans do end up taking glanders and weaponizing it and spreading it amongst all of the aliens, basically killing all of them. So we do win the war. But this weaponized glanders does end up mutating and spreading around the earth and killing more people in the years after the war from the disease than actually died during the war. Which I think is an analogy to the Spanish flu, which I didn't know this but it happened shortly after World War One, and it ended up killing more people than actually died in World War One. So we had a massive man made war which killed you know millions we settled our differences we ended the war and then we ended up getting kicked in the butt by nature life is cruel so yeah a pretty cool timeline this one and i mean what do you expect when you involve aliens time travel always super cool but that is all we have time for. There will be four parts in total to this iceberg, as it is huge and each of the new entries ends up taking way more research than I think it will. So keep an eye out for both part three and part four, as stuff does get wilder and wilder the more deep into the iceberg we go. And as always, thanks for watching.